I want to talk about abstraction layers in C++. If you're asking yourself what that is, it's not a feature that exists or anything. You know, don't try to scratch your head. It's a new thing. All right. So I'm going to start very briefly uh, with introduction, who I am. Uh, as I mentioned, I work in uh, Millennium, and I am uh, developing C++ code. But uh, just recently, I'm also officially going to start writing more Confluence pages. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a developer. And I'm also uh, you know, working hard on the guideline side. And I think it's a very important thing. I'm an active member of ISO uh, C++ workgroup, which is called Workgroup 21 as the Israeli NB chair, Rangers study group chair, and um, other things as well. I also help with library evolution. Um, yeah, I'm also involved in organizing uh, C++ international conferences, as the one you see right uh, now. <laughs> I think we can, whoo, <laughs> for <course>, CPP. <laughs> And I think we can uh, you know, uh, safely say that this is an international conference with uh, around half of our speakers coming from abroad and uh, maybe the second largest conference, C++ conference in the world. So I'm very proud. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Yeah, and I'm also a C++ Now program chair. So uh, there's some people here with uh, C++ Now t-shirts. So go to them and ask about, uh, this is another really, really good conference. It used to be called uh, BoostCon. Um, to summarize, I love language and software design, and I'm really keen about cataloging stuff. <laughs> so that may be the reason why you're about to see what you're about to see. Um, so the talk is going to have four parts. We're going to start with talking about what are abstraction layers. We're going to define this. Then we're going to try to build an abstraction layer model for C++. We're going to look at existing solutions to try to solve the problems that we encounter. And then uh, future solutions uh, or how can we do better. That's the four points. So let's start with definition. What are abstraction layers? So I think we all agree that software development is all about communicating logic to the computer, right? We want to make sure that we say the right things to make sure that the computer understands us and do the right thing to minimize the amount of bugs. And to do that, we need to apply some level of abstractions. That's the exact point of not using assembly to write your code, right? You want to have abstractions, which is one of the things that's, in my mind, C++ is doing very, very well. So let's look at the terminology. Um, abstraction is the process of removing or generalizing data to focus attention on details of greater importance. That's from Wikipedia. So here's my first example for this talk. As a C++ developer, you look at this code. Um, try to, to tell me if there's something that bothers you with this code. You can raise your hand. <laughs> you can shout. Sorry, size. Size. Yeah, that always comes first. <laughs> Interesting. OK, so remember, this is a slides code, so you don't get everything. Uh, but yeah, apart from size. Pointer right. PTR, right? You see pointers here. What are we trying to do with this example? What, what, what like in a single line, what are we trying to do here? Iterate. Trying to iterate, right, on a thing. And we try to print the thing. Why do we need to see pointers? That's Bad design. This is better, right? Because now we actually iterate on a thing. We use index, right? But we still iterate on a thing. And that's, you don't see the pointer anymore, I guess. And the index might be wrong. Yeah, and the index, that's true as well. Thank you. <laughs> and as I think maybe uh, some of you, I hope all of you agree with me, this is, this is better. And you've seen in a previous talk why, right? We don't get the implementation details here. We basically state what we want to do. That's great. That's good code. So let's see a different example. Say I have this um, you know, system, and I want to choose some messaging technique. Anyone knows you know, how do we do things when we try to pass uh, information? You can do it. What? Email. Sorry? Email. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Email, that's good. <laughs> We can do push notification, right? We can do pull, we can do message queue, we can do like, you know, something like a message board. 
we don't have enough information here to decide which, right? So in a sense, what we saw in the previous example is over, uh, sorry, is under abstraction. What we see here is over abstraction. We care about the technology that this thing is written at, right? We don't see that in the diagram. We care about which components are and what's the latency requirements. That's very, very important to decide. Sorry. So yeah, so I've shown you two examples of under abstraction and over abstraction. And I think I'm trying to say here something that we very often miss is the point that abstraction is not just about generalizing, but it's generalizing to the right level. So this is a quote from former head of electrical engineering and computer science of MIT. And he says, and I like this definition better, the essence of abstraction is preserving information that is relevant in a given context and forgetting information that is irrelevant in that context. And I think that's the key to good programming. So I want to start with a very simple example. And you may not look at this thing and think about abstraction layers, but this already have abstractions inside of it. <coughs> we have an array here. We define some pointer. And again, ignore the bad coding style. And we iterate. And because the, it's a char array, we expect to move one byte, right? This is very familiar. All C developers know that, and also C++ developers need to, usually. And if we replace the type of the array to int, we now get something different. We get, you know, the same code, the same thing. We didn't change a single line, we changed the type. And the type now signifies that we move four bytes. So my point here is, even though you don't look at this thing as abstraction, this is already some sense of abstraction, then you need to keep in mind both things. You need to keep in mind the type and the memory layout in order to expect correctly how this thing is going to behave. So there's two things here, right? So I want to show you an additional example. And again, you may think that this is uh, you know, not relevant. Uh, I'll tell you soon why not, why, why you're wrong. Um, we have an int here. And let's say in some way I took the address of this thing and I now dereference it and use uh, the address to, uh, uh, add, uh, to put something in the address. This is UB, okay? This is, this is something you shouldn't be doing um, according to the current standard. And the example is about three things. About the duality of int and memory address, right? Int is also a memory uh, address the invalidity of the address in this specific case, and do you be created by uh, doing what we're trying to do? And this all been mentioned in a paper called Non-Deterministic Pointer Provenance. But we don't care about those things, right? I mean, we're modern C++ developers. We don't care about addresses. How many people think we don't care about those things? You know, and assuming you have the latest C++ version in your company, you're working with 20, you're about to move to 23, everything's great. Do you care about those things? How many people care? Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm guessing you're embedded developers. <laughs> How many people don't care? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I can tell you that the standards committee cares. <laughs> And it cares so much to have around six papers, I think, or seven so far. Latest is the one that you just saw the example from. Okay, this is in 2022. This is quite recent. Uh, so I admit that this is a fix for wording, but we still care about the UB, and we still care about making sure that those things, you know, work together. And this is modern C++. It's not the C committee. It's the C++ committee. So. I think we now all uh, understand that there's few layers of abstractions in our code. And the problem that I try to tackle is how do we mark them better? And how do you address them better? How do we comprehend them better when we write good code? So we're now going to try and build some abstraction layers model for C++. So what I did is I went over all the keywords that we have in the language and all the key on the uh, library headers that we have, and I classified them, OK? <laughs> and we're going over uh, and analyze uh, the keywords in the library, and we're going to try to identify uh, to which group are they belonging to, and then uh, uh, the borders between the layers. 
And of course, I'm not going to do the full thing here on the talk, so <laughs> don't, be, don't be worried because we have a lot of them, but I'm going to show you a few uh, examples. And the idea is that we'll be able to identify dangerous parts in between those layers. That's at least my um, uh, hypothesis. So looking back at the example with the UB that we looked before, and we have the address, we've mentioned that it, takes, uh, it cares about the invalidity of the address, right? So we're now talking about memory layout. The duality of int and memory address, this is types, right? It cares about you know, the type system. And the UB created by using this, which is the layout control. I've defined this thing as a layout control. How do we uh, you know, control the layout control? and the pointers and the references and the handles. Um, now this model is, uh, is uh, you know, my suggestion, but uh, we can discuss later if you wanna do things, uh, classify them differently. Um, so just to give you a hint of what do I mean when I say types, so it could be like uh, language defined types, wheelchair, but also uh, library uh, types like suit float and costs. This is really, you know, costs care about types, right? <laughs> and char conver conversions, and uh, civic qualifiers, that's still rele somehow relevant, and limits. And when I say layout control, I'm talking about pointer references, but also align as, align of, things that care about you know, where your bits exactly sit on the binary. And the memory allocation is things like new, delete, memory resource, header, scope allocator, et cetera. So let's add to that. Uh, I put aside the memory layout and I now refer to program source code general uh, you know, view of binary. Again, we can discuss later. Um, ASM, things like inlining, go to, things that control how your binary is going to come out, but not in a bit level, but more uh, generally. Source location. And linkage and models, everything that relates to either modules or include uh, export, import, uh, extern, etc. And I just want to emphasize again, what we care about as the, as the, I mean, in my mind at least, is the border between those. We're going to see why it may help. So uh, as I promised, I'm not going to go over everything, uh, all the keywords that we have in C++. We have many of them. Uh, but this is the general model that I've uh, classified all the keywords uh, and the library headers to. And as you can see, I try to also say, okay, we have things on the lower levels. Those are the things that people that, you know, care about the, how the binary looks like. All of you who raised your hands <laughs> cares about. And there are things that we uh, don't usually care about uh, in those, uh, you know, in industries like high frequency trading, maybe we care a bit, but industries that care more about higher, uh, level uh, like finance, uh, not the you know not the really the edge cases, um, and also algorithms, ranges, containers, things that are trying to describe our program in a higher level. And again, uh, I would not go over all of them, uh, but I'll leave this uh, slide for a second and <laughs> let you see, and 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 you're gonna see how many of them uh, exist. But uh, any questions so far? about what I said. All right, cool. Yeah, and that's uh, another example. We have logic operation, control flow, things like that, compile time, placeholders, auto, templates, type def, numerics. Some of the things I wasn't sure where to put, so I put them in uh, one place and also took a note to myself that they maybe belong to a different place. And just to scare you a bit, <laughs> These are uh, all the keywords of our language. I, I mean, I probably missed a few, <laughs> but most of them. And these are the library headers. So if we go back to the example with the UB, we can now use this classification to identify different parts of the program with different layers. So technically, we could say this thing is, belongs to the types layer. It's a type. We define a type. And this thing belongs to layer control. And maybe, you know, maybe we need to be very careful when we try to do those things, uh, do, do, do those two things in the same uh, snippet of code. So now I want to show you a different example, and uh, this is very recent. And this is an example that we've been discussing in Ranges study group, and we're still trying to uh, solve. 
Um, so look at this example. We have ISS, I, IS, Eastern Stream, uh, 0, 1, 2. And we have a while loop iterating. And what is this thing going to print? Feel free to shout. Yeah, zero one two. <laughs> uh, you knew the answers in advance. No, yeah, it's zero one two. It's not a trick question. It's very very simple. Sorry, we iterate and then we get zero one two. Great, that makes sense. Now let's add, add uh, ranges into the equation. Okay, now we have the ranges header. We create the ice, uh, ice stream string uh, ISS, and then we push the thing into ice stream view and we take one from it, all right? And we iterate. What do you think that we're gonna see? Uh, and then we extract uh, back to J. What do you think that we're gonna see uh, printed now? Zero one, zero one. Zero one okay. Other, other uh, suggestions or you, you can guess? No. <laughs> okay, so Haskell here in the front line, thank you for uh, reminding me, he's going to do a talk in this conference on exactly that example uh, and with more, with more details and how he tried to solve this and where we are now. But uh, no, you're not allowed to. <laughs> um, and Barry Rasmin, by the way, also had a, a talk about this <laughs> code snippet in CPP Now and the videos are not yet published, but I urge you to go see it. Uh, so any other guess? Yeah. Exactly. So what, what we will see? Yes. Almost. Okay. We're going to see zero and then two. <laughs> and I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> you know, it really bothers me deeply that, that this is what we're going to get here. But the um, reason that this is what we're going to get here is that people that wrote ranges and the people that wrote iStream string, they, they didn't talk. Right. They didn't like didn't set this was the first thing and then ranges come later and there's a mismatch here. So these are the papers. So the first paper is by Haskell sitting in the front row. Uh, as I mentioned, he tried to fix this. We didn't fix it for 23. We're thinking about wider scope problem to fix it for 26. Uh, but there's going to be more papers to follow. And by the way, I also really recommend the Closed Ranges May Be a Problem uh, paper by Tim Song. And he's trying to actually address, like, there's a problem with definitions there. Um, but more papers to follow. So to summarize, we should still try to fix this, right? So if you look at this in the model that I've just uh, proposed, we'll see that we can mark the first part as I.O., okay, for example. And then we see that this thing has been uh, you know, uh, pushed into ranges, and then we try to address this with IO again. Right? So we can now at least classify what happens in this code in a higher level of abstraction than what we could if we just look at this you know, uh, specific line uh, ISS uh, you know, uh, into J. And in, just to summarize, the problem here is that the ranges takes ownership of the thing, and we create a mismatch. Okay, so I've explained to you what I think I want to see in a code base. Uh, let's look at existing solution, and then I'll go to maybe potential uh, alternative solution that I can offer. So before that, C++ operates in, on larger numbers of layers, right? That's exactly its, 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 its key feature. I think this is the, the thing that makes this language very beautiful. But abstraction layers, uh, you know, they can, they can not uh, go well with each other. And in they are dangerous areas on which we're trying to move between different abstraction layers, and I think that these are the areas on which bugs occur. So I think that our logic should take those under consideration. When we write a program, we need to, uh, you know, uh, be uh, aware when each time we're moving between those layers. So, what can we do now? We can literally create better code, right? <laughs> we can avoid those things. By the way, just to mention the example that you saw, uh, it, ha it had a bug in it. it. It's not how you're supposed to use iStream stream, okay? But I'm not referring like, the, it's not the technical or the, uh, the bug, it's the why can't we see this as developers? 
So, you know, create better code, that's nice. We need to uh, create boundaries, use encapsulation and namespaces and headers and modules. And we can use guidelines that Bjarne have correctly mentioned very, very briefly in his previous talk and for really good reasons. I think that guidelines really help with that. But also I think uh, there's other things that can help. <laughs> and just to emphasize what I mean by encapsulation in this specific example, instead of the iStream string, we could technically wrap this thing with a wrapper and then, I don't know, in some way block the ability and get an error, block the ability of using this um, as an iStream string. Say, right? This is just like uh, hand waving. <laughs> but that's what we mean when we say encapsulation. And I think there's a great example of good line, uh, guidelines in uh, David Senkel's uh, talk, Up to Code, from CPPCon 2021. And it's great because it uh, exists in idioms and we're, we're familiar with the guidelines, at least most of us, I would hope, and we know how to use tools. But the downsides are that just teaching everyone or enforcing this creates unacceptable overhead in, in some ways. And it's a challenge, especially for large projects, multiple teams, et cetera, large companies. And it doesn't help with cross-boundaries code. So technically, um, you know, we could enforce the guidelines and still get code that looks like the example that I've shown before, the ice theme string thing. So let's look at a different, uh, another solution. We could use different language. And when I say different language, what I mean is modern C++. <laughs> because modern C++ is a different language in a sense that it gets rid of a lot of uh, you know, error-prone code that we used to have, okay? That's better uh, practic practices. Um, and we can follow modern idioms to minimize logic errors. So we describe, uh, discard previous error-prone code, but we need to now learn and deploy a whole new language, each new standard, right? Because some people, I, I, don't, I don't think, uh, it's, not, it's not the general case, but some people look at those features and feel that, you know, they're looking at a new language, and for good reasons, we're doing a lot of progress. And we didn't provide a solution for existing code, right? Like, we can't just say, okay, just move to the new version, use the, the you know, non-error code, and we're now you know, uh, safe because we have a lot of legacy code, a lot of existing code that we need to maintain. And also, there's a lot of uh, projects that care about assembly C and C++ code. They are some domains that care about those things. And as I mentioned, the cross boundaries code is still a problem. So what do I propose? <laughs> so, I think we need to apply the model that I've mentioned before on our code, and I need to, uh, and we need to um, be able to use this to better identify the uh, how C++ combines together. So, <laughs> so I don't recommend moving to a new language, <laughs> but I do recommend apply this logic to get error messages. Now, why do I address error messages and static analysis tool? Because those things are the things that you can actually do without changing the syntax and the backward compatibility of the language, right? If you could, in, in a sense, by giving a different error message, you change the scope, you change the way the developers look at the code, because you can tell them, instead of telling them, go to line, blah, 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 uh, the template instantiation have failed because of blah, 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 you can tell them, You've tried to use ranges with IO, for example, okay? You can change their perspective on the code just by giving them a different error. And I think that applying this model of warnings and error gives us better uh, uh, static analysis uh, way of, of approaching things. We're basically moving our developers to a higher level of abstraction. So again, I offer a static analysis tool. And this thing can classify, uh, at least I, you know, uh, my POC <laughs> tries to classify tokens according to layers. So I uh, didn't do uh, the exact, uh, you know, the, the full flow, but I did uh, wrote a Python script and I gave it in advance the tokens. And if we now look at example like array, we could basically look at the token R and classify this and then we can 
uh, classify the I.O. and see that we're trying to use size of, which is something from you know, types, that's how I defined it, on something that is an array, you know, it's a, it's a type, it's a container, or whatever. And we get error that says on line six, R changes abstraction layer from container to types. You now trying to look at this thing as you know, maybe not the right tool. You're trying to combine two tools from your toolbox that don't necessarily need to fit together. If you go back to the iStream string example, we now can classify the first thing as IO, then go and say uh, iStream view is a range of thing. We wrap the ISS and we now turn everything into ranges. Now the thing, the ISS, belongs to ranges. And we get the proper, you know, warning. <laughs> and then we c continue, uh, uh, you know, using ranges uh, utilities to process this thing. But then on line seven, we notice that we're trying to use IO and we can see that in the tool. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so I think this is I think this is more useful than the errors we now have, and I don't think that we need to replace the errors that we now have, but I do think that we may want to consider adding something that is in a higher level of abstraction. So just to uh, you know to show you how the <laughs> the output of the thing looks like, and please uh, you know don't go over each line. There's a lot of bugs and and things like that. And uh, by the way, Dima helped me with that. Uh, he's a Python developer more than me. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so you, you can see that the tool uh, uh, gives you the warning that on line six, on line seven, sorry, variable ISS changes abstraction from IO to ranges, right? And we now be able to give the developers to tell them, hey, look, uh, you're trying to do something, and uh, you know it's not that the instantiation of the template fails in a fifth loop of whatever, and you ran out of memory. It's you're trying to do something that doesn't make sense logic-wise. All right, so I want to show you one more example uh, with coroutines, which is I believe it's really emphasized this point uh, again, and then I'm going to talk about all the downsides or <laughs> the restrictions on what uh, you know I'm showing you because uh, it's not as great as I'm trying to. <laughs> uh, okay, so coroutines. Coroutines are in C++ 20, and that's great. And what is a coroutine in two words? It's something that you can um, uh, pause and then continue. Okay, so we have here. Um, uh, some, uh, you know, do work coroutine. And the, the way this track, and I don't want to go uh, deep into that because this is not a coroutine talk, but I do want to like emphasize the point of, of, uh, of the design. We have the strike task and you need to implement some things according to predefined, uh, you know, um, names like promise type and get return object and initialize suspend, etc. And then you can resume the thing, okay? And the whole idea is that you create this work handle and you call do work and you do whatever is uh, the initial thing that the core team wanna, wanna do. And then you pass the control to, from the main to the core team. Okay, and then you do whatever the core team wants and then you go back to main and you can do resume to go back, etc. So the whole idea is that you transfer the execution. Okay, and this is handle run. Sorry. And this looks very, very similar to something that we want to uh, standardize for C++26. Sender receivers or uh, std execution, okay? We want to standardize an async uh, framework, async uh, operations framework. And uh, by the way, also go to see Bryce's talk about the future of C++ and a lot of features uh, that we're gonna get. But, sorry. But this is very similar to what we saw with coroutines. So yeah, we have a thread pool and we take a scheduler and we wanna take uh, the, you know, the scheduler and do work. And exactly in the similar way to what we saw for coroutines, we wanna be able to suspend work from main, we wanna pass the control flow to the to the function in this case in the flow in the uh, pipe, uh, the sync wait, and we want to take back the control after the thing uh, finish operates and continue on the main. So as I mentioned, this is very similar, and the authors of sender receivers 
actually had this uh, in mind when they were working on the proposal. And they know it's similar, so they tried to combine it together. And, and that's great. Um, so yeah, you can combine coroutines with async operations, with async algorithms. So you can define the do work thing just like you saw in the pr uh, first slide, and then you can push it into an async algorithm coming from sender receivers. And that's great, but you can't, you can't do that you know, without any thinking. And I've talked with the authors of sender receivers and asked, like, is there a limitation on the coroutine? Is there something that you need to do differently in order you know, to, to push it into a different framework? And the answer was, yes, <laughs> you need to uh, avoid the policy of suspend never and you suspend always because otherwise the whole process and you know, the, um, you know, freezing the, the operation doesn't work great and we have problem with error handling, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so yeah, the answer was yes. And I think that this really says a lot about what I'm trying to talk about here. The fact that we have uh, one framework and we try to use a different framework combined with it. And sometimes, you know, we need to be very, very aware of the fact that we're now using things from different worlds. And by making this, maybe uh, classifying this, uh, we may be able to have something automated like static analysis tool to do that. <laughs> okay, so um, I just wanna say two more things about limitations and I mean, okay, I show you this thing, but clearly I, I guess some of you have uh, noticed that you can't uh, create an error for each moving between abstraction layers. It's not, it's not you know, visible uh, because uh, you're get, gonna get a lot of them. So what I'm proposing is not doing that, but I do propose to, do, uh, you know, to consider some things with their uh, instantiation types like templates. Uh, it's not a different thing. You uh, address the template with the type that it instantiates, Exem example by Hannah, by the way and then you can get what you expect. So the whole point of wrapping something with another thing um, moves the layers between. And false positives, as I just mentioned, are very, very, very common. So what I think we need to do, we need to get the list of problems and then we need to go over them and identify the ones that are really problematic and then get them into our studying analysis tool. But in order to do that, we, has, we have to classify. We can't do it without the classification that I proposed. So again, in this case, uh, this is a completely valid code, uh, perfect, uh, perfectly reasonable code that may create this uh, error. Uh, so again, we, we can't just, you know, we can't just push the thing uh, into a static analysis tool. We need to uh, have some more process uh, within it, maybe with AI, I don't know. <laughs> um, and again, just to emphasize the importance of this thing, um, in the committee mailing list, someone was asking, I don't know if you're aware of std format, but someone's asking, sorry, how does std format uh, works with uh, uh, strings, right? And uh, Unicode strings, sorry, UTF-8. And we got, uh, this, this thing, we got an, an, uh, you know, an answer from the author of Stood Format, but this thing emphasized that we care about types in I.O. and how do they combine together. Okay, so you have to put the K in the beginning, that's the answer. <laughs> and Unicode, uh, by the way, is being discussed for C++26, which I think is great. And Unicode is a great example, Unicode's proposal is a great example of what authors can do really good because the Unicode author have actually cared about how the std format prints his types. So he defined uh, formatters, what's called formatters, within the proposal. Okay, so this is a great example of how you do address other layers inside your proposal to make sure that you write good code and error prone, uh, and not error prone code. And that's how you can do it. You can actually um, you know, use UTF-16 uh, thing and then convert it and print it and everything's gonna work as expected. Cool. So to summarize, how can we do better? So looking at, you know, a piece of code, we now give it to the compiler. The compiler gives us uh, compilation time errors, compile time errors, right? And then, we move, we, we take this piece of code, we put it on the target system, or we start to test it, or we start to stress test it, or whatever, 
And we get the runtime errors. The runtime errors are related to the data that we feed into the system, right? It's not something you can uh, uh, necessarily identify in compile time. But I'm also, and of course there's also logic errors. But I'm suggesting that observing the code in those using those layers would actually allow us to move some of those uh, logic errors into earlier stages, because now we have some classification that we can get, give to our static analysis tools. And I think it's gonna save a lot of time and a lot of money. So I've mentioned that I use the Python uh, script uh, tool. Um, anyone recognize what that is? Anyone you know, seen something like that before? What, what, who, what? Yes, <laughs> thank you, Daisy. <laughs> You're cheating, though. <laughs> yeah, Daisy is one of the best developers I know. Go to her talk uh, keynote, actually. <laughs> That's where she has in a keynote. Um, yeah, this is Clang's AST, and some of the things that we've talked about that we've that I've gave manually to the tool can be found in AST. Um, so I think uh, you know you can see here the type and the int pointer. And you can see the conversion and the type of the uh, address that is long. And you could, from that information, extract um, the, the layers that you know, we've uh, recognized as long as you feed the tool with your classification. So I'm basically suggesting add a layer of anal analytics. We have compile time errors and we have runtime errors. I think that abstractions and abstraction layers can give us abstraction resolution errors, errors that we don't see because we're used to working on one piece of code, um, you know, delivering a library or delivering a proposal. And I think that it's very important to notice um, how you combine those with other proposals with existing code. And I think it will allow us to apply uh, the logic, uh, to, to identify the logic bugs in an earlier stage. And we can do it by compiler, static analysis tools, or other tools that use ASC um, and have this information. So the full solution. <laughs> you need to focus on interfaces with the user. And I think we need to create ergonomic study group, as David Senkel, who's also given a talk in this, in this conference, <laughs> have mentioned before. I completely agree with that. But I also think we should address abstraction layers as developers, as we write code. And this is the most important thing. This is the thing I want you to take home with, uh, to go home with. Um, when you move between abstraction layers, when you move between uh, different libraries, pause for a second and make sure that you're not doing something terrible. And I also want us to address abstraction layers in the standard committee. So whenever someone writes a proposal, like the Unicode uh, proposal, which has done great work, we need to take those things under consideration. And of course, we need to examine the wider picture when we write proposals. And my suggestion, or I think we should uh, move forward that, is to add the abstraction layers also to our static analysis tools. We need to add additional layer of errors that actually identifies our logic errors. That's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. How much time do I have? Oh, okay. How much? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, yes. Yeah, so I just want to summarize. I wave hand through, you know, over some of the problems that we may have, and it's not trivial. Um, that are not trivial, but I still think that's uh, doable and uh, the POC, you can play with this, uh, it's on the GitHub repo, so, yeah. So, um, any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, you focused a lot on uh, standard abstractions. What do you think about, you know, code bases and custom abstractions? Do you envision something like attributes, annotation systems? Yes, exactly. <laughs> thank you. No, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Victor asked a great question about like what happens when users define their own types. So yeah, first of all, I get, I get this stuff in the uh, New York uh, media. It's gonna be, I think you need to also give the users a way to, uh, you know, mark their code. So yeah, something like attributes, something like, you know, uh, that you can actually fit in this 
Now, one problem that I have with attributes is that if you use attributes, you're not going to get uh, your code full of you know, too expressive code. Uh, so I would actually hope for something more along the lines of you know, uh, flags that you can, or whatever, you know, a file, uh, a configuration file that you can feed into the tool and then. Uh, but yeah, attributes is like the general direction and maybe doing it differently um, by feeding this as a configuration. Okay, other questions? Haskell. <laughs> Great talk. Oh, yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, very interesting idea. I can't wait to see the tool. How, how many classes of uh, issues did you have eliminated from all our code bases? And uh, just for the record, I don't agree about uh, the comment about the ice cream and they just uh, talk to each other. <laughs> Sorry. Come to my talk. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, <laughs> so just to give the background, the example was uh, taken directly from uh, Haskell's paper, and, <laughs> and I mean, you know, it's debatable whether we want to see code like that or not, but the one thing I wanted to emphasize is that if we do want to support code like that, we want to take this under consideration on ranges, and I take full responsibility that, <laughs> you know, we also should have done our job better. So yeah, thank you for the comments. Yeah, go ahead. Um, question. Um, What's your name? My name is Ron from uh, Cadence. Oh, nice to meet you. Hi. <laughs> so great talk. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so did you consider also looking, so, okay, so you divided into layers and you said this layer is not good for Yeah, oh, yeah, I can actually. Did you consider um, that maybe sometimes yep. for particular, particular instances, particular functions or particular uses of that layer is good and for others it's not good? Yeah. And then maybe it's a higher resolution sort of analysis. And the second part, do you think that type trace can help here to identify those yeah. different operations? So yeah, I mean, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly the things that I've mentioned as wave, ha uh, hand, uh, wave handing. Um, yeah, sorry. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm not a native English speaker. Um, yes, not all of them. Like, I don't want to run this thing on a code base and, you know, and go and search for each. I think there needs to be additional processing. Um, yeah, definitely some of those use cases are valid, perfectly valid. But also when we write compiler errors, we don't just, you know, automatically run. We don't just decide like, okay, um, you know, we do some analysis and we do use the model that we have of the program. So that's why I think it's uh, perfectly, you know, reasonable to also do that um, for that. So yeah, I definitely agree that, um, yeah, you, you need to process this thing a bit uh, and not just uh, give the whole example. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but I do want to mention that I think that at least for uh, standard proposals, the example in standards are, you know, when you propose a, a new feature, um, processing using this tool can actually help you identify at least on the proposal stage and if you wouldn't do something, you should like, I don't know, it's very trivial to use UTF-8 and print it using a std format. But if the author uh, wouldn't have thought of that, then putting this example in the paper, running the tool over it, would have told them that they didn't, um, you know, didn't consider that. Hi, Daisy. <laughs> Hi. Go ahead. So I, I want to ask a more fundamental question here. Mm -hmm. And that is like, is changing abstraction layers inherently bad, right? Like, no. if, if, if we have something in the standard that causes bugs when you change abstraction layers, should we be putting that on the user to stop changing abstraction layers, or should we fix the abstraction layer? And I know it's not always one to one, but right, like, yeah, it's. It's not one-to-one. -one. I'm, I'm and, and I'm not saying, I'm, I am genuinely asking, right? I yeah. don't, I'm not trying to convey an opinion here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I love that question. She always brings up hard topics, and, uh, and that's, that's great. Um, 
I completely agree with you. And that's why I said, I don't think that all of those things, I don't necessarily think that we need to put all of those things in the static analysis. So there's gonna be some stages here. The first stage is to go over our proposal and look at those abstraction layers in regards to our proposal and make sure that we propose something that is correct, you know, um, compared to this model, like uh, taking this model under consideration. And then only the things that we think that, you know, um, last common thing, and I think there's, you know, some things come to mind, like, I don't know, casting, um, container, whatever, things that you don't want to do and pretty clear that are bugs, you can identify. Because you now say, okay, I have a container and I have a cast, and it's not just like, you know, it, it's not a semantical, it's not a um, technical bug, it's a logic bug. You try to cast something, yeah. So I think, again, I don't think that we should get rid of what we currently have. I don't think that we should uh, you know, use this blindly. I think we should use this model, and the first stage is the classification that we currently don't have. Like, you know, just by classifying, you're able to actually um, uh, you know, abstract things and, 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 and look at them in a higher level. And then when we have this model, we can go over uh, its outputs and get some, yeah. But I totally agree with you. This is not, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, Noam. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. Uh, I, I blame Daisy for my question. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, so uh, following what we just discussed and looking at the slide that you are now showing. Um, Can you talk closer to the mic? Sorry. Yeah, so given what we just uh, discussed and the slide that you are uh, currently showing, I'm starting to imagine, can we define some sort of metric or distance yes. between the different layers of abstractions and the direction between where things flow? I don't, I don't have any real use case yeah. at the moment right now, but I'm like, it looks like it. Thank you, Noam, for that question. <laughs> Great question as well. Because this also came up in the New York Middle and I forgot to mention that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. What I'm trying to say here is that we currently have no metric, we currently have no data, have no the classification allows us to have data, to collect data. Because one, once you classify, you can now uh, identify how many uh, changes between layers you have in this specific piece of code. And if it's 15, I don't know, if it's five, then maybe you have a problem. If it's two or one, maybe it's okay. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that, you know, just getting the statistics is also uh, something that we can do. Uh, but before that, you know, we can't just go and classify each line of code in this way we can generalize. So yeah, I totally agree with you. And someone um, also off, uh, proposed something like a threshold, like okay, if you have over 10 uh, uh, layers uh, changes between uh, in, in five lines of code, maybe you're doing something wrong. Yeah, that, that could be very interesting, I agree. Yeah, Daisy, go ahead. So the other concern I have with this analysis, and this is about the third, fourth time I've seen this talk from you, and it's gotten better each time, to be clear. Thank you. Um, I didn't, yeah, I didn't it, change. It really has. I didn't change anything, but. That, that's not, it's not even remotely true. It's yes. a lot of work. Um, the other problem I have with this is that a lot of the analyses you're suggesting require a global understanding of the program, which means that it, it's not scalable, right? It's not something, something needs to understand that there is a place somewhere in some library that this is called after this, meaning that these two abstractions are in juxtaposition. No, no not really, because I classify tokens, and tokens are you know, things that AST looks at. Right, I, I don't know. Two function my... calls that do the two things in your but it... example. Right, you do the stream right after the range. No, so let me, okay, let me, sorry, that's, that's a good point. And it wasn't the, it wasn't the order, I let me because that's oh, okay. I actually jumped maybe too fast on that. It wasn't the order that was creating the problem. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize. Okay, yeah, it wasn't the order. What happens here? ISS have a classification. The type is uh, I don't know IO for example. Just you know, 
because I picked it like that. <laughs> and then in, if you see the green part, ISS has been injected into a ranger's utility. Now the ranger's utility is, is wrapping, it's, an, it's a, you know, it's, something that wraps the ISS, and now the ISS type uh, layer is transformed. Now we get, the whole thing is blue because the whole thing is ranges now. Like this took ownership of ISS. And we get the, wait, wait, let me finish. And we get the first thing now, okay? And this is not an error, by the way. Sure. <laughs> but then we continue to operate in the ranges uh, scope in the ranges uh, mindset, and that's fine. We can, you know, use ranges algorithms, but then we try to do something different. The operator there is again going to I/O, and then you get the correct error thing. So it's not the order I give. Uh, I tag. I, I give. I, you know, each token. I give it. I define this as you know belongs to one of those groups, and when the token being operate, operated by a function or operation from a different group, like say, ranges library, then I you know, identify the problem. So it's not an order, yeah. So you're saying that as lines four and five were in some function, then that function would be tagged with the abstraction yeah. layer level. No, and no. Lines six and seven were in a different function, that function would be tagged and then you could see. Yeah, it's not the function, it's the object that the I assume view, it's the view in this specific case, and the view being pushed into an algorithm, a take algorithm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now, it's really good that you've uh, emphasized, like, I, I may have skipped that too fast. Um, okay, sorry, Adi is uh, sign signaling here. <laughs> um, okay, so I just want to thank you, everyone, for your, li for your attention, and uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you.